Good day and welcome. Our guest today is Canadian actor, musician, director, writer, producer, and voice artist, nominated for a Genie Award for his best performance of an actor, a nominated Gemini Award for best performance as an actor, also nominated for a Daytime Emmy Award, and a winner in 1991 for a Young Artist Award for co-starring in a off-prime time series, The Road to Avonlea, for his portrayal of Felix King. You may recognize him from one of his many performances in The Christmas Toy, The Twilight Zone, Friday the 13th the series, The Hidden Room, Ghost Mom, Tales from the Crypt Keeper, Free Willy, Anne of Green Gables, The Day My Butt Went Psycho, Working Moms, <laughs> The Umbrella Academy, The Boondock Saints 2, Fubar, or perhaps you'll recognize his voice from his work on Wild Kratz, Ollie's Pack, Corn and Peg, Inspector Gadget, Ranger Rob, Total Drama, and even Arthur. These are just a few of his continuously growing 127 credited productions. Please welcome Zachary Bennett. Sir, thank you so much for your time today and welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, what initially inspired you to pursue a career in acting? Uh, I, I moved uh, to Toronto from London uh, with my uh, with my siblings and my parents and my mother was actually pursuing uh, an acting career uh, at the time. This is when I was about four years old. And uh, the agent who met with her said, do you mind if I meet with your kids? And boy, was that a mistake. Uh, because we all just started working immediately in, uh, we started in commercials and then moved into film and television, but, uh, my mom's career, she turned into a set mom pretty fast. Uh, but yeah, so that's, I, you know, I was given the opportunity. I was always a very theatrical, uh, little kid. I'd like to put on uh, Michael Jackson's thriller and uh, perform it around the living room. Um, and yeah, it just kind of went from there. And are you still performing Michael Jackson's Thriller in the Living Room today? Hell yeah. <laughs> Look at me go. Right after I hang up with you, actually, I'm going to throw it on. Go nuts. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you discovered that about yourself at such a young age, how did that help shape your understanding of yourself and who you are today? That's a good question. Um, I think that it, it gave me the opportunity to... Uh, to really, I guess, uh, to be more of an extrovert than I, uh, extrovert than I thought I, I was going to be. I, I, I was, you know, I was always a sensitive child, and I think that would have maybe caused me to to turtle a bit into myself. But, uh, but by kind of being uh, welcomed into the into the performative arts at such a young age, I was able to yeah express myself from that point on, and 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 I really fell in love with acting pretty quickly. Like I, I, it was something I had, I just kind of jumped right into with both feet and have continued to enjoy as I've matured. Yeah. Now, do you mind if I ask you a question here? You had said that you were kind of a, a sensitive child. Could you kind of share with us what you mean by that? Yeah, I still am a sensitive child. I, 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 I'm just, I wear my heart on my sleeve and, uh, I, I, I tend to, uh, uh, react emotionally. Uh, I think that is a, a benefit as a performer. Uh, but you know, it can be a bit of a setback when you're, you're a kid and you're, you know, arguing with other kids or someone makes funny and what have you. It, it, uh, all of those moments in, in my childhood tended to, uh, to hit pretty deeply. Uh, I actually re recently wrote, a uh, a semi-autobiographical, uh, screenplay about a kid kind of uh, trying to just be a normal kid while trying to uh, navigate being a, a child star. Um, because, yeah, during that time, it was, uh, when I was younger, it was it was very hard. So I, you know, when I started doing Road to Avonlea and became a bit more of a household name, uh, just going to school, even though I went to an art school uh, called Claude Watson, um, it was still, I was still kind of teased because kids didn't quite understand uh, how to, I think they just didn't know how to handle uh, a 
kid in their class being on television. Uh, so they kind of turned on me a little, a little bit and, and, and trying to kind of navigate that as, as a child was, was very difficult. Yeah. Well, it's not the same as today where every classroom has a, a TikTok star and an Instagram model. In it. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the screenplay that you're working on, uh, do you have a title for it? Yeah, it's, it's pretty finished at this point, but it's called never too young. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's, it's, it, instead, there's a um, Shia LaBeouf made a film recently called Honey Boy, which kind of followed, it was a semi autobiographical film kind of following his childhood uh, on film sets and dealing with uh, his tumultuous relationship with his father, where, where mine is more, it's, it's much more, I, I, I took from my experiences as a child actor, but I created a, a very fictitious character and circumstances, but, but mine basically follows the kid coming off of a big film and then just trying to integrate back into regular life and the difficulties he faces uh with that and, and hitting puberty and what have you well it's weird that you mention that because a lot of these times you know we see these child stars from the 90s and the 80s but we never really know their stories and how they integrated back and if they did or didn't so it'd be really interesting to see that screenplay when you're done thanks yeah yeah it's a. Uh... It's it's a, not the easiest to read. <laughs> it can get a little a little uh, disturbing, but I also I, I also love to uh, pepper it with the uh, humor, so <laughs> so it's not too dour. So when we when we talk about these childhood emotions, and you know we have to as actors personally connect with characters. How do you personally connect with the characters' emotions and the roles that you play? Um, I mean, it, it, it entirely depends on, on the kind of character I, I'm, I'm playing. So when I was a kid, I was able to, I, I kind of find that children tend to think on a more, how I look at it as a, a more two dimensional level where they just kind of accept their, their circumstance. And so when I was a kid, I just would leap into a role given the, the, the character breakdown in the script and kind of understand and, and dive right in. Uh, now it can get a bit more uh, difficult. Even in my early 20s and, and 30s, I was able to uh, see almost every role as a challenge uh, and, 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 and find kind of the humanity. I, I, I did a film called Desire uh, that was written and directed by Colleen Murphy, uh, where I played a child murderer. And it was it was a something, and I was only nineteen when I played it, and it was something where at nineteen i was I was able to just kind of see that as as an artistic challenge and and, and throw myself into the role and and the film. Uh, I don't know if I could do that film today as a father now and 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 just just I think i would it would it would hit way too too deeply for me, uh, you know, so it, it's it's. I find I, I pick and choose things a bit more carefully as I get older uh, because I don't really need to put myself into the shoes of, of terrible people as much anymore. So that's, you know, I mean, I do play, you know, Zach Varmatek and Gourmand and Wildcrats and they're terrible people, but they're, they're cartoon terrible people. So <laughs> they never tend to go too far. They never actually murder anything. <laughs> no, they're uh, creature powers. <laughs> no, it's, yeah. it's a show. You know, you, you brought up an interesting point when you talk about these pieces that land on your desk. How do you know which audition to take and which one to decline with your experience? Can you just, you know, read the breakdown and say, hey, this isn't going to be for me? Or do you say yes to everything and see what happens? What does that look like for you? Uh, for me, I mean, it's 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 a difficult uh, thing to do sometimes because, I mean, it, you know, it is how I make a living. So I have to, if I'm going to turn down an audition, it's going to have a ripple effect uh, that goes maybe beyond the character I'm turning down. So if, if I have an audition for a television series and I turn down one character, then the casting director might not be so inclined to, to bring me out for, for a, a secondary role. Um, so sometimes, yeah, sometimes I do just do the audition um, because that audition could represent my, my, uh, acting chops for the future of the show at, it, in case I don't get the role. Um, but I have turned down roles recently, uh, auditions for roles recently, uh, where if the character is uh, bigoted in any way, hmm. uh, it just doesn't, uh, it's not something I want to get typecast into. It's, it's, and, and there have been a, a, a number of, as I get older, 
there's a number of you know racist cop roles that you know co <laughs> land on my desk that that I have to think very clearly on if I want to represent this character or not. Uh, but mostly, I I think mostly I I'm pretty comfortable with. I have no problem playing bad people. I really actually enjoy uh, uh, being. I, I think the word villain is a bit strong, but I enjoy <laughs> people with flaws. I think that's that's really as a performer, it's 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 that's my meat and potatoes. It's fun to jump into that stuff as long as it, uh, as long as it doesn't, uh, as long as it doesn't kind of get me, yeah, pigeonholed. <laughs> oh, that's fair. Yeah. So as we talk about these emotional states and how you get your head wrapped around that. You know, often as actors, we have to deep dive into our emotions and explore something that's vulnerable of ourselves to bring out that character. Have you ever done a role or can you reflect back on a role or a performance that just kind of really had that profound impact on you emotionally? Yeah, it would, it would definitely have been the, the character of Francis and Desire. Uh, it was a yeah a film I did in 1999. And he wasn't just a, a child murderer. I mean, that's that's broad strokes, but he was very complicated he was uh, he was a victim of abuse from his childhood, and he was also a concert pianist. So I had to learn how to ape that really well. I had to I had to kind of pretend to play uh, Franz Liszt, you know, uh, and that was that was a huge challenge. I and and I I, I loved the experience, but I I did have a complete kind of uh, physical and mental bit of breakdown afterwards, just from the sheer exhaustion of how hard I had to. To work at that role for the six weeks that I that I shot it. Um, there there are other other projects. Kind of, I, I I'm able to really leave it at the on set mostly. Uh, I I just because I've done it for so long, and I guess starting at such a young age, uh, where I was able to just flip a switch, really, uh, it kind of has stayed with me in many ways. So I can go on set and, and have a rough day, but then I know I can come home to my family and just leave it on set and, uh, and not kind of, you know, brood in the character any longer than I have to. So in your career, would you say that playing Francis was the most challenging role for you? Or was there another production that you said, hey, you know, Francis was was pretty bad to get behind, but this production over here was harder. Oh man, there there's so many different stories. Like sometimes it's the character. I think Francis was an exceptionally um, consuming character. I don't know if he was the most difficult character to play because Colleen uh, Murphy wrote him so well. It was uh, a privilege uh, to be able to to. I haven't played many many leading characters in my career, and that was. Uh, one of the high points, but yeah, it was very, very difficult. It was very taxing emotionally. Um, but yeah, there have been other roles I've played where, where, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, just playing um, Nick Stolanovich in on Fubar was I. It was difficult because I was I was playing. He's Moldovian, and so it was just having to get that accent down and 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 come across as as realistically as possible within the parameters of a wacky action series. Uh, you know, it, it, I don't I I I don't do wacky action every day. So it was uh, to keep the pace and to keep the energy and the vibe of the show going uh, well working on this voice and speaking like this, you know, I was like, okay. <laughs> and make it believable, you know, all that stuff. It was, uh, it was fun. It was tough, but yeah. Well, that's awesome. Fubar uh, is actually Netflix number one right now, if I'm not mistaken. It's their, uh, their highest streaming uh, current show that they have out there. Take that. There you go. Oh, amazing. And is your character going to have any reoccurring roles in Fubar? Oh, I doubt it. He's just a, a sad putz who was in the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> Fair enough. It's, it's still, a, if you haven't seen uh, FUBAR on Netflix and you have Netflix, I would encourage you to go out and watch it. It is a, it's actually very entertaining for a lot of reasons. Um, <laughs> but I want to ask you something. In 2004, you actually founded an indie rock band, Yonder, and it was later rebranded into Stin, Tin Star Orphans in 2008. Yeah. How did your musical journey begin? When did you kind of switch that gear? Um, when I was so a little, I can't remember the year, but a couple of years previous to that, I was uh, I took my guitar with me. I was shooting a mini series, a CBC mini series uh, about the um, uh, about the Canadian, the first Canadian 
uh, summit to Everest in the 80s. I think it was called Everest. And uh, my character, uh, who I played, uh, he, he uh, well, he died halfway through. So, uh, you know, we don't shoot chronologically. So I was, I had a lot of time on my hands. We were shooting in Alberta and British Columbia. And I, I had many, many days, sometimes um, uh, far away from civilization in a tiny little like motel somewhere. So I brought my acoustic guitar with me and just started kind of really going to town and, and, and started really songwriting. I've always written songs. Like I, I used to write a bunch of songs when I was a teenager and stuff, when I was really into like, Radiohead and the Smashing Pumpkins and, and then but then I, I was really kind of getting into more of a Wilco and an alt country vibe and uh, just started yeah started writing away and when I got home I had enough that I ended up messing around with some friends and and started yeah started yonder and I I got it, it was a fun experience I don't really play anymore I released yeah three albums with uh, with Tin Star Orphans but um, it started kind of as an actor pretending to sing and and I got I got a bit better at singing and a bit better at songwriting and it became more uh truthful and uh yeah I was really uh it was a fantastic experience I my heart and my my hat goes off to uh excuse me anybody who who uh, uh pursues music uh for a living it's uh it is a very uh, uh thankless uh, uh, <laughs> thankless art uh, to to turn into a career, uh, especially in this day and age. It's very very difficult to make a living. But yeah, we, we you know we we loved playing live and 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 I had a great time and 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 doing it. But but yeah, getting people to come out and see your music, even it's uh, it's a chore and a half. And and after about a decade of it, I was like, okay, that's good. I I had fun back to back to acting now. <laughs> So during your your yonder years, did you have a primary source of inspiration when you were creating those songs? Um, yeah, Jeff Tweedy was always a huge inspiration. But he's the front man of Wilco, and uh, and yeah, I just uh, a lot of bands. I mean, Neutral Milk Hotel, and 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 then there were there were like uh, uh, local like Toronto bands that I, I was really into, and, and artists, and and. And I was just, yeah, I was really just inspired to uh, to kind of, I, I loved the theatrics of, of the songs I was writing too. I, I wrote like a 12-minute a, a song called Deadly Medley that I loved performing with my band and, you know, lots of fun stuff like that. So, you know, I, 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 I've always been a huge fan of kind of, uh, studying the the, po the 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 lyrics and the liner notes of my favorite records, and and then getting to kind of explore the poetry of that was 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 just a blast. I'll switch back to to acting for you. Know most people understand that in a career of acting comes even a longer career and a longer list of rejection. Mm. Can you share with us some of these times when you faced rejection and failure, and how did you bounce back from it? It's, it's, a, it's an ongoing thing. Uh, I, uh, I was just, I, I teach on camera acting and I was just telling my class that like, like I, I was, uh, I, I'm sure I was second choice for about five different projects last year alone and where they, they, they contact your agent to say that they, they've got you kind of on hold or what they say is pinned uh, for a project, which means that basically it's a very, it's you, you're part of a very small group of people that are up for the role still. Um, so you cross your fingers and hope for the best. And and the way it's gone in the last couple of years, it's been, I haven't gotten those roles and I've lost a, a tremendous amount of work uh, just by luck of the draw. Uh, and the rejection never goes away. It's, it's kind of part of the process and, and the old, you know, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger is, is very, very true. And uh, how I kind of, uh, cope with that is is that i just i i do kind of reluctantly sometimes you know say onward and upward and and keep pushing forward i also have really gotten into uh writing and directing lately and 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 kind of expanding uh what i do uh on the screen that way and so that's been um i can always kind of turn to to those sides of things and and I mean, I've been very lucky to have a voice career as well as as an on camera career. So if ever you know, so 
there's for every rejection for every disappointment there is always something to look forward to on the horizon so that that keeps me going and the fact that it's just that now in my 40s i can clearly say that i'm i'm very comfortable with the fact that this is simply a career for me now it's it's not it, you know i love the art form of what i do and i i love what i get to do i think it's a privilege at all times but like i'm not kind of I'm not chasing uh, anything, any anything beyond uh, just just working now. You know, no, that's fair. Now, from your director's point of view, is there an actor out there, Canadian or non, that you're like, you know, that's the person that I would love to to point the camera at and kind of coach and direct along the way? You know, it's I, <laughs> not to not to kind of jump in on promoting my little short, but I I. I get the opportunity to work with some of the finest uh, actors and performers out there and, and just, just people in general. And, uh, and I've known uh, the actors, uh, uh, Jean Yoon uh, and Julian Richings uh, for, for years and years. And I, I really wanted to, uh, I, I worked with Julian on a, a, a really cool film uh, that's coming out soon called Relax, I'm From the Future. Uh, written and directed by Luke Higginson, who's maybe one of my best friends. So there you go. Uh, and uh, I worked with Julian on that. And Julian, you know, has an incredible career, uh, but he's always kind of playing a weirdo. Uh, <laughs> if you if you look him up, you'll see, oh, Julian Richings. And, and you know, he was just in Ari Aster's uh, um, Bo is Afraid. And he, he when he got to set his the, the name on on his door was was old man with big nose you know <laughs> so i said have you ever just played like like a just a lovely normal dude and he's like well you know not really and I'm like, well i'm going to do that i'm going to write that so i and 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 gene is someone who i i never actually worked with but i I've, I've had the the pleasure of of watching her career over the years and and being a big fan of her work and and i was also inspired to just take these two actors put them together and and make it just a kind of a simple gentle love story yeah uh with one hell of a twist let me tell you but um <laughs> and so i i wrote this film literally with them in mind and was was lucky enough to get them both to say yes to it and it was such a a, a pleasure to be able to to work with the people who inspire me and when uh, will the, the the general public be able to see that project? Oh man, I, I that I I'm not quite sure. I know like we we've uh, we've definitely been accepted into one festival, but I'm not allowed to talk about it yet. Oh, it's still true. under wraps. But as soon as it is, and I'll let you know too if you like. Um, but yeah. I, I I'm hoping that uh, I can I can share it with the general public as as soon as possible. But yeah, we've got to go through the festivals, and they don't like us sharing it with the general public. No, no, <laughs> it's the hardest part <laughs> they have their whole do we get the premiere status if not and you're like exactly yeah. there you go yeah so beyond acting writing directing and, and some music what other passions do you pursue that contribute to your personal creative growth i'm a big gamer i'm a huge gamer uh, not a lot of people love to hear that but uh i am uh pc or console i console i'm a, I'm a playstation boy uh, and as well, I have a steam deck now too. So there's that, oh, wow. but yeah, I'm, I'm all over the place. Um, and, uh, I've, I've just looked at my, the, I just saved, a, a my son, he's, he's not only not even four and he's asked me to play Elden Ring. Um, <laughs> and I just looked at the hours and I'm, I'm like 450 hours almost in Elden Ring. It's, it's insane, but yeah, so that's where I blow off steam for sure. I, 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 you know, I don't really go out anymore or anything like that. So, so that's, I like, you know, I love to watch television uh, with my wife and, and also play a hell of a lot of video games. <laughs> yeah. I'm, listen, I'm, I'm jealous. My little guy likes uh, watching Paw Patrol and Peppa Pig. So it's, uh, <laughs> those yeah. video games are great, but they're incredibly uh, challenging. Sure. Let's say that. <laughs> yes. Oh, for sure. And they're a time suck. Like I, I'm, I, I don't think everyone can uh, have the time to play these games like I do. So that's that's like, and I've 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 had the privilege of of uh, you know acting in some some games, and that's been a really fun experience too. So so I get to kind of, you know, I was in the uh, Division Two recently, and so I was able to like my friend and I were able to play the campaign that I was the bad guy in, which was really fun. That's really cool. <laughs> that's yeah. <really> cool. <laughs> 
So Zachary, I want to ask you something. What is something that people tend to misunderstand about you? Um, I I think that some people I I find that some people tend to misunderstand that like they they tend to associate characters with the actors who play them sometimes. Um, I don't necessarily uh, have that issue so much. Uh, back in the day, um, I did, and, and actually, I remember very clearly uh, Gemma Zampronia, who played my sister, who played Felicity on Road to Avonlea. Uh, Felicity was um, was uh, uh, not the not <laughs> people called her a bitch. I don't know if if, if that would be like the way I would I would refer to, to the character as but but Gemma if she was having a hard day and just kind of needed some privacy people would be anticipating that she was going to be just like her character and would kind of she had I remember the the pressure she would be under for that um for me it's it's I think people just uh sometimes assume that that uh I'm a I'm a pretty quiet guy I'm pretty like you know um uh, I, I, I'm not, yeah, I'm not very outspoken. And, 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 and I think some people may, uh, may anticipate that based on the characters I've played or, or the music I've made or something that I'm, that I'm a very verbose, uh, uh character, but, uh, they're sorely disappointed when they meet me. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> well, I want to ask you something. Is there something that we as a society, you believe we need to start doing or stop doing as of tomorrow? <clears throat> I think I was, my, my wife and I were just having a big, long conversation last night about, about AI and about how she, she's quite, uh, she's quite concerned about AI taking over everything and, 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 uh, taking jobs from people and i'm i'm not as as concerned as she is i i really think that um a, we tend to panic i i my thoughts go to y2k and how we 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 tend to kind of really create a bit of an orwellian uh, perspective on this uh i i think that that i'm not denying that ai will will create some friction in its time but I don't think it's it's going to wipe out uh, whole uh, sectors. I, I just really don't. But I I will say that I think that what we need uh, more of is uh, we need. I, I find that this day and age has has really created a bit of a um, an isolated hoarding kind of complex in a lot of people, and I think we need to be a lot more inclusive and. Uh, and I think we need to reach out a lot more. I think community is suffering a lot right now these days. And uh, and I, as somebody who prefers to be alone 24 seven, let me tell you, I think it's really important to uh, to be a part of your community and to and to and to look into outreach more uh, and getting out of your own head and your own life and changing your perspective on giving rather than taking. That's very well said. And where can people learn more about Zachary Bennett? That's a good question. Um, I, I think uh, I think just uh, the old IMDb is a good is good to follow me. It seems to be up to date pretty well, which is nice. Uh, and yeah, I'm 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 around. I'm I'm uh, I like I said, I've got my uh, this. I'm, I'm starting to write and direct a bit more, and so I'm I'm pushing that. Uh, well right now and and that and uh yeah yeah so i think online i'm around instagram <laughs> star zachary uh nothing else i just got kicked off facebook it was the greatest experience of my life <laughs> oh, i gotta ask you why did you get kicked off facebook that, that there was like something something about like basically here's the here's the long and short of it my sign in was uh zachary at tinstarorphans.com and i let tinstarorphans.com expire that doesn't exist anymore so i can't log myself back in and they're like we we deleted your account or we we froze your account because we're concerned of some activities or something that are not affiliated with my account <laughs> and i i could clarify it but i i've taken it as an opportunity to step away 
so you know i'm on i'm on, i'm still technically on i'm on instagram i'm on twitter you know both under tin star zachary but i'm basically like i'm like social media is eating me alive man i gotta guess <laughs> <laughs> so if they want if they close the door i'm like no no, no keep it closed it's fine that's one last <laughs> one last thing oh man <laughs> Hey, well, Zachary, I have time for one last question for you today on Coffee with Chris, and it's what makes Zachary Bennett smile? Oh, man, hands down my family. Uh, I have uh, I have two sons. I have uh, uh, one of them is uh, he's he just turned 22 and he lives out in B.C. And, and I don't see him nearly as much as I want to, but he's he's killing it out there and loving his life. And and the other one is uh, downstairs right now uh with with his mom and he's uh he he's gonna turn four uh next uh next month and he's he's just the the greatest thing ever especially because he likes to play elden ring i don't know if that makes me a terrible terrible parent to admit that i play elden ring in front of my kid but he literally says fire giant dad fight the fire giant <laughs> but yeah uh boy, spending time with my my, my family is just 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 the bee's knees. Uh, we have a cottage on Manitoulin Island that we're, um, it's my, my, my in-laws cottage and we're, we're heading out there for Canada day, uh, weekend. And I'm, I'm looking so forward to just, just having that quality time with everybody. Well, that's absolutely amazing. And Zachary, again, that was my last question for you here on coffee with Chris. You've been absolutely amazing. Everyone check out FUBAR on Netflix, Google Zachary Bennett, find them wherever you can, just not on Facebook, of course. Uh, <laughs> Everybody out there, smile to inspire and have a fantastic day. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Chris.